read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners hey you're here for the second installment of two of by c by Ines johnson and I forgot to mention it on Tuesday's episode, but if you want this in ebook, she's got it for free. So Mel's going to put it down in the show notes and all that good stuff. We'll have it posted everywhere. Um, so yeah, if you want this as an ebook, go grab it. it. That's all you have to do. That's super easy. <laughs> so I thought yeah, that was awesome. Sign up for the little link and it'll shoot it to you in an email. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it on the website great. too on her page. Mm-hmm. So it'll be anywhere and everywhere. I love it. Um, I didn't ask you last um, Tuesday's episode, but what have you been reading? Did you read anything during the break? I'll start no, if actually, you didn't. It's okay. I don't think I did. Like I scrolled through, but mm-hmm. I don't think I did. I binge. Like I said, I've actually been binge watching old Bryce Dillis for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why it popped in my head. <laughs> You're like, you know what I need to watch? Angry Brides. <laughs> They're so, so angry. I don't know if it's just like a book slump or if it was just a conscious choice, but I haven't read anything in a, probably about a month. I don't know why. Like I just, uh, there are books that I've downloaded that I've purchased, <laughs> but I just haven't made an effort to read anything in the past couple of weeks. Maybe it was yeah. just a, maybe it was just a mental break too, along with this break from the podcast. And I'll say being obsessed with Downton Abbey, that kind of did it. <laughs> that, that took up a large quantity of my time yeah I don't know because it's interesting that we both kind of stepped away while we were on our break and didn't really read I I mean I I read a few like small things that people like could sent me like of course Jessa Dean Mm -hmm. released a book and like I saw that one Mm -hmm. (laughs) I saw that email (laughs) so I read that one you know, mm-hmm. Fiona Davenport sent me one of her shifter one. I always read those, mm-hmm. but nothing like that. I can nothing really too talk crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I started listening to Go Hex Yourself by Jessica Clare. Um, so it is is something that we've talked about that um, that neither one of us really likes. It's the witch books. Mm-hmm. But the cover and looks so cute. The story so I read the book cute. bio and it looked cute, and it has an audio. I know that's what I was gonna like. That's what fucking took me out. So I went on a book crawl, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But I found the paperback, and it was so pretty that I was like, I'm just gonna buy it because you know it supports a friend, but also I fucking love the cover. It's so pretty, mm-hmm. and um, I had the audio pre-ordered, so I finally got to it yesterday, and I've already I'm already halfway through the book. But um, it when I hit play, and the, it's a dual narrator, so it's a guy and a girl. And when the guy's chapter came up, I literally screamed. I was like, it's Lukov! Because it's the same narrator that does from Lukov with Love by Mariana Zapata. Uh-huh. It's Teddy Hamilton. Like, uh-huh. which, I mean, I get it. But he used, he uses his real name on this one, on the Jessica Clare book. It, he didn't put Teddy, Ham- Teddy Hamilton. I think that's like his smutty book name. And then he has this contemporary book name, which is something else. I don't know what it is, but um, I'm going to look it up now that I'm saying that because I should say it if I'm going to mention it. But yeah, so when that came on, I started screaming because that's just how I know him forever. He'll That voice will always be Lukov's voice to me. Yeah. But um, hold on. That's kind of, oh, his Andrew Iden. That's what he yeah. has as his like professional name, I guess. But so, so the premise of the book is why I think I like it. It's because the heroine is just a normal person and she goes for this job. She sees a, a like um, an advertisement for a job in a newspaper and she's like, I'm super broke. I need, you know, to do something. This ad sounds cool because it talks about magic. And she's like, well, I play Magic the Gathering. She's talking about the card game. And I play so Magic she, the Gathering. I know. That's what made me think about you when I was reading it. So she's like really into it. She's talking about how she builds decks and all this different stuff. And she plays all night. Da, da, da. And so that's what the advertisement sounded like. It sounded like she, someone wanted them to come talk about it. And she was like, are they a designer for the cards? Like, what is this? Mm-hmm. So anyway, she goes 
And it's a real witch that needs an apprentice or like she calls them a familiar. And she was like, I need a new familiar. Mine's pregnant. She's going out on maternity leave. I need somebody to fill in her spot. And she was like, yeah, but witches aren't real. So this girl is like the heroine, Ricky. She like, um, wait, is it Ricky? Did I say that right? I can't even remember now. Oh my God. Anyway. Yes. I think that's it. I think her name's I haven't Reggie. heard that name in no. forever, actually. It's Reggie because her name's Regina. I think it's like her real name, but she goes by Reggie. It's just kind of cute. And so anyway, so she is just like, okay, I'll go along with what this baddie old lady says. Sure, sure, sure. I'll give you some like dead salamander. Okay. And so she goes and she, and she sees like magic proven to her and she's like, what the fuck? <laughs> she kind of like freaks out. But what's funny is that um the older witch that's there, she has a nephew and he's like, he's at the house and he meets her and he's like, I don't like this girl. She's a human. She's not in the world or whatever. She needs to go. And he's like trying to get her fired. But at the same time, he like keeps saving her job. Like it's like he doesn't, mm -hmm. it's like he's trying to sabotage her, but then he just, he doesn't at the last minute. He's like, no, it's fine. She can stay. She can do this or whatever. And it's Aww. adorable. Yeah, because he's, like, really pissed off she's there. And he's, like, I can't stop. He was, like, I jerked off to her fucking freckles last night. What's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. And I love Jessica Clare's writing because she writes great heroes, mm -hmm. especially ones that are, like, surly and grouchy yes. and, and, like, kind of, like, just – like just real quiet and you know yeah. just grumpy all the time but her heroines are just like oh god like you know knocking stuff over and kind of funny but also like it's she's writing really heartfelt stories too and so this one's really interesting because the hero in it he's a warlock which is like a male wizard i mm -hmm. guess which but um he uh he doesn't have like any friends nobody likes him and so the heroine kind of feels sorry for him because she hates him. And then she was like, well, no, if I, if I don't like him, nobody will like him. So yeah. that's why she starts being nice to him. So it's like I said, I'm halfway through and it's so fucking cute. There's this one part though that I laughed my ass off. So it's not a spoiler. If you don't want to know anything, just fast forward. But it made me think about you, Mel, because there's a cat, there's a black cat in the house and he comes in and she's like listening. She's like eavesdropping on their conversation of like the woman, the older woman and her nephew. And he's like, I don't know what she's doing here, blah, blah, blah. And she's eavesdropping. And the cat walks by her and goes in the room. And she's like, oh, I guess I'll go in too. And so she goes in and the cat sits up there and they were like, were you eavesdropping? And she's like, no. And they turn to the cat and they're like, was she eavesdropping? And he does something. He was like, he says, you're lying. And she was like, yeah, well, he was just licking his balls on my bed. So she was like, you can't listen to what he has to say. And they look at the cat and they were like, you did what? And the cat like takes off running like, oh, shit, I've been busted. So it's like the cat like knows he's not supposed to do that. And he just fucking did it in front of her because she's not magic. You know, she didn't know. It was so funny. Oh, I love that. I know. It was really cute. It made me laugh. So I was like, and I, 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 Jessica Claire has cats and stuff, too. So I can imagine like she like playing the scene out in her head, too. <laughs> So it's it, like, it's so charming and surprisingly really, really good. So, I mean, I didn't know if I would like it with the witch theme and stuff, but it's written from a, like, kind of a novice perspective. So yeah. it's not like super heavy about it, but I, I love it. It's really, really fun. But, um, but yeah, so I did a book crawl um, with my friend Sydney and we took our kids. It was spring break and they have this thing that they've set up. It's an independent book crawl. And so there were indie bookstores all over this area of North Carolina. I think there was like maybe a dozen or so that signed up to participate. You got a map and every store you went to, if you bought a book, you got a stamp. And so a lot of them were used bookstores. So the books were like super cheap. Some of them were newer ones where you could buy like new releases or whatever. So we went around, I think we hit eight of them. Six or eight. I don't know. But we went through and it was so fun because like I said, we took the kids with us. And so we started out at like the furthest one and kind of worked our way back. But there were so many bookstores that I had never been to before that were like so close to me. I had no idea that they were there. Yeah. And so this sort of like kind of forced me to go check them out. And so they have this thing, like if you get all of them stamped, you get like this big prize at the end, like each store is offering different things for if you take your, your final map to it. And so, and they also, while they're, this is going on, 
they did a donation box that you could donate um, children's books that they have like this organization that donates all these books to underprivileged kids or gives them to like places that need them. So it was just, that was really cool too and inspiring to be like, okay, kids, let's go take some books to donate. Like let's, you know, take some books with us. Let's grab some new ones. Like it was just such a fun adventure. And we went to one bookstore in particular, and I think it's called Urban Reads uh, or Urban Books here in Charlotte. And it's a black owned bookstore and they sell like all black authors. And that oh, was wow. really cool, too. Yeah, that it was like a specialty bookstore like that that I had never been to. I bought like eight books in there. Like my, my kids walk in, they're like, oh, I want this and this. And, th and they were just picking out all these kids <laughs> books. And I was like, OK, let's do it. So they actually had um, Stacey Abrams. They had her books there, and they had her romance books there, too. She writes under, um, oh, my God, I just drew a blank. Selena, wait, Selena Montgomery. Yeah, I've read her books. And so um, she, they had those there, too, and they had a whole black romance section. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, there was erotica there, too. I was like, all right, oh. this store knows what's up. I know. I was like, so they're <laughs> catering to me over here like, with, the, with the sexy section. So yeah, it was, it was great. I loved it. So I had never done anything like it and I didn't know if this was like a national thing or what. And so I talked to one of the ladies at the bookstore and they were like, no, we just kind of got together and decided to do it. And I was like, oh, that's nice. awesome. I know. So if, if you're listening and you have like local bookstores or libraries, d talk to them and see if they'll do a book crawl. Just ask something like that. I mean, it was fairly inexpensive from what I gathered talking to the ladies that were there to print the maps. And they just put a stack of maps at every store that participated. Mm -hmm. So you could go in at any time. And as long as you bought something from the store, they would give you a stamp. So I, I thought it. that was also a way to like support your local bookstores and do something fun with the kids, especially over the summertime. Like I think that would be a fun thing to do. This only lasted for the month of April. So, I mean, if you went through like the summer or something, I think it would be fun to try to hit even more of them doing that. But yeah, it was just a way to like sort of, I don't know, just participate and get out of the house and not like sit on the couch the whole time. But I wanted to ask too, your husband's 40th birthday was last hmm. week. So how was yeah. it? Did y'all do anything special? We just went out to dinner. And what did you get? Watch movies. We went to what Ramsey's. What do you, you still get the same thing when you go there every single time? No, they actually, they don't have crab on the menu. I don't know if the seasonal what the fuck? thing or something. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't crab on the menu, but no, I think he got a ribeye and I got scallops and we kind of shared. Oh. And of course, we always go for the um, sticky toffee pudding. Toffee pudding, yep. That's mm -hmm. so good. I'm not it's even, I don't even like sticky toffee pudding. Nope. But for some reason, it's because it looks like a stick of butter. That's why. The, I, the ice cream that comes with it looks like a stick. It is so good. Oh, mm -hmm. God. There's so a bad. damn thing wrong with it. I remember when I ate it, I was like, yeah, I get why this is your favorite. <laughs> so it's good. really good. Um, what did you, did you said you watched movies? What did you watch? Are we caught up on our show and stuff like that? Uh, we okay. watched Love After the Lockup. We're behind, or we'd been behind, and we caught back up a little bit. Did you guys watch the new Batman? Y'all went and yeah. saw that, didn't you? How did you we like had, it? We watched it when it came out. Yeah, I, I haven't talked it. to you since then. <laughs> no, it came out like a month ago almost. I did it like. really? Yeah. I thought it like just came out. Mm -mm, no, no, it's been like three or four weeks since we went. It How did you like Robert Pattinson as a Batman? You're not a Twilight fan, so I'm going to say you're an impartial jury. Yeah, so I didn't, I don't see him as the vampire other people see him as. Mm -hmm. You know, me and my husband had a, a thing about it because Rob was like, I don't see Batman as emo and a recluse. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a billionaire playboy. And I was like, yeah, but people are really into the recluse now. And he plays a recluse well. Mm-hmm. You know, he's yeah. angry. and Is that how Bruce Wayne is in this new one? He's a recluse and emo? Yeah. He's oh, a recluse. Oh, weird. Nobody ever sees him out. He doesn't leave the ha house. Uh -huh. But, you know, in Bruce Wayne's history, there are moments of him being recluse. Mm -hmm. And with Batman was a little bit more woke, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. in some of its topics it touched. Mm -hmm. And I think that the billionaire playboy wouldn't have come off too great right now i can say that yeah so you know, 
The recluse oh, sorry, go ahead. worked well. Well, and I was, my husband watched it, and so he was kind of telling me what he thought about it, and he said that he found it interesting because his takeaway was that Bruce Wayne had not been Batman very long in this movie, so it was like he was kind of finding his feet with that. Yeah. So he wasn't, where like the other Batman movies, it was like they had been Batman for years, So that's why they were maybe more cocky and more arrogant because they had this superpower, you know, they had been a superhero all this time. So they were sort of untouchable at this point. Whereas with this new one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen it, but I thought that was an interesting takeaway that he got from it and that this Batman was young compared Mm -hmm. to the other ones too. He was much younger. Yes. He felt very young. I felt like he was, Still really mourning the loss of his parents Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's true. He was getting his footing. I'll say this, though. This is totally free. Robert Pattinson could get it any day of the week. It's sparkling or not. I love him. And I don't know why. Like, it's not like I'm even, like, attracted to that type of person. But I think it's because he's such an incredible actor. Like, I really respect him as an actor. And I swear to God, if he does some Me Too shit and he fucks his shit up, right, I'm going to delete this episode. I don't (laughs) think he will. I think that part of his... He has big dick energy. He's very confident Mm -hmm. in himself. He does Mm -hmm. not, he doesn't care what you think of what he does, it Mm -hmm. seems like. So I I feel like he really supports women. And I really like that aspect about him too, that he seems really supportive of women and his cast and his, like his working partners and his relationship partners. He seems to like really champion that. And I really appreciate that too. So I don't know. I just I love him, but you know, but I wonder, for this life. was not cocky. Mm-hmm. He was very open to listening to people, and when people criticize him, he didn't get mad or whatever. He just kind of took it and nodded, yeah. and you know what I mean. He was, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. that's a good assessment. Um. I also want to say before we get into the second installment of Inez Johnson, um, today's my anniversary with my husband and he had to work late. We had, I had Girl Scouts, we had to do the podcast, like it's fucking Monday, you know, I had shit all day long. So we didn't really get a chance to celebrate. We went out to lunch together, but it was like 30 minutes and hurried because he had to get back to work. But after Girl Scouts and baths and stuff, I came downstairs And my youngest daughter, she had set up a table in the living room and chairs for me and Kevin. And she made us a pretend dinner for our anniversary. And it was the cutest fucking thing. I cried. It was so, she had a menu written out. She had drinks and plates and food. And she was the waiter and our cat was the cook. And so like, she like went through this whole thing. And she was asking me what I wanted for dessert. And I told her that I want, she had fruit sandwiches for dessert. And I told her, I want a fruit sandwich with strawberry and pineapple. And she goes, um, we're out of pineapple. <laughs> and I like, we're out of pineapple. This is make-believe, okay? And <laughs> she's fucking out of it. And I laughed until my stomach hurt because she just looked at me dead ass in the eye. We're out of pineapple. <laughs> like, imagine some more, if you will. <laughs> that's adorable it was so fucking cute and i told her i was like this is literally the best anniversary dinner i've ever had it was so sweet and then it was nice because like kevin and i sat there at the table and talked and everything while she went to the kitchen with the cat and made the dinner with the cat it was so cute so let me just say if you're having a hard time with your kids right now sometimes they're okay it pays off at some point sometimes it surprises. sometimes you wake up on saturday morning and your kid shaved her head what (laughs) no did she shave her head yeah wow i woke up saturday morning i like looked over the rail she's saying i was like you don't have no hair it's like yeah what do you think (laughs) what did you think I'm like, it looks fine. I don't know. <laughs> it was TikTok. Did TikTok make her do it? I don't know. I don't know. Like, well, or at least I don't got to take you to go get a perm. Oh, my God. That's right. Was she still permanent? 
She's primed it a few times. Yeah. More, yeah. yeah. She looks cute with curly hair, though. She, I guess yeah, she, she looks fine out. with a bald head, too. Some people can't pull it off, but her head is for sure finely shaped. So oh, I'm going to be like weird and lumpy. I know it. I've never seen my head. <laughs> it's probably got some fucked up bump back here. I don't know about. Well, good for her. It's I'm sure it's liberating. <laughs> but I hope to God I don't like wake up and do that one morning because I'll just die. I'll be like, what? You had such glorious hair. <laughs> and it'd be a fucking mess too that'd be the other thing <clears throat> i wouldn't want to clean it i'm not really surprised remember that time like six months ago she's like you care if i do a mullet i'm like how about it she's already, like in the bathroom with a razor I'm like, yeah whatever. you should have known then <laughs> do whatever you want all right just don't so, make a mess yeah that's um, that's what i'm saying i just don't want a mess to clean up go yeah. at it <laughs> Um, let's play the second installment of Two of by C. I just want to remind you guys real quick. Um, enter this week's giveaway. She's giving away three signed paper bags. Um, and also check out the series, The Nye River, Nye River Adventures and the Misadventures of Lauren. If you like urban fantasy with a side of romance. And the Knights of Carleon. I think it's that Carleon. If you like steamy paranormal romance. Um, so in those, all those worlds are together. There's a bunch of crossover in it. And then there is another book in this series, The Two of I See. If you want to check it out, um, it's coming out in July. So make sure you check that out too. Um, and all, again, I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but just in case you fast forward and you ended up here, um, you can get this ebook for free right now for of two of Bussy if you just go download it. So we'll have all the links in the show notes and on the social medias, all that good stuff. So let's right. do it. <laughs> we'll see you guys on the other side. Chapter five. She tasted of the salt and sea and everything he'd never dreamed he wanted. Her breath was a freshwater breeze on the wind. The tip of her tongue was the tide lapping at the shore under the full moon. Sai was drowning in the shallow pool on the other side of Vivi's lower lip. He sipped at her and found his pleasure in the divot at her top lip. He discovered rapture in the crevice of her bottom lip. When their tongues met from across two lonely shores, he built a bridge of forever to her that had its foundation in his heart. The sea witch had cast a spell on him, and he was caught in her net. He kissed her again and again, even if his kisses matched the number of the individual sands of all the oceans. It would not be enough. He had to temper himself. He was foaming with the need for her. He knew that where he wanted to take her was uncharted territory for her. Sai had had virgins before. He knew that's what she was by the tentative way she touched him by the small gasps of surprise that escaped her perfect lips every time he changed the angle of his kisses. Something about her innocence clutched at him, awakened something dark and possessive in him. He swore she never would know any other man besides him. He'd be her first, her last, her everything. He needed to be gentle with this precious coral reef of a creature. He needed to woo her slowly. She was so easily frightened, and he needed to let her know that he would be there always to provide for her, to protect her. So, of course, he gripped her hard. Sai pulled her from her seat across the table and deposited her on his lap. He ran his teeth along Vivi's upper lip. She yelped when he clamped down, breaking his promise not to bite her but he couldn't help himself. She tasted like a sea of tranquility. She didn't pull away from him. Vivi leaned into him. Curious thing that she was, she offered him more of herself. Greedy bastard that he was, he took it. Warning bells sounded in his mind. He was alarmed at how quickly and how completely he offered his whole being up to this woman he barely knew. But in the heart, he didn't need to beat in order to live. Sai knew that Vivi was a necessity to his very existence. She didn't wrap her arms around him and try to sink her hooks into him like other women. She didn't pull away and ask for a favor now that his head was muddled with want of her. 
She didn't reach for his balls and twist them into a vice until he did her bidding. She leaned into him, hesitant and unsure, at the same time eager and curious. Sai's grip tightened even more as he pondered how to lay claim to her heart. He decided to start with her shoes. Reaching down as he kept his mouth slanted over hers, Sai slipped the magical shoes off Vivi's feet. They fell to the marble floors with a thump of the toes and then a clatter of the heels. He wrapped his fingers around the tips of her cold, bare toes. The need to put them in his mouth and warm them overwhelmed him. He pulled back from Vivi, wondering what her reaction would be if he laid her out on the table and proceeded to place her feet in his mouth. He didn't have a chance to find out. As if the gods heard his need to warm his beloved's feet, the dormant kindling in the fireplace roared to life and blazed bright. Vivi squealed like a sea otter and hopped off his lap. Her feet contacted the ground, but without her shoes, she fell down onto the cold, hard surface before Sai could catch her. From her place on the floor, she looked up at the fireplace and screamed as a man stepped out of the flames. Beg your pardon, said Desi, his brows as high as the fire he'd climbed through. Didn't know you had company. Desi shook the flames from his business suit. With a wave of one hand, he doused the fire, and it instantly cooled. With a flick of his other hand, he removed his sunshade and surveyed the scene before him. Sai reached down to set Vivi on her feet again, remembering only after her feet sickled inward that she couldn't stand without her magical shoes. And so he held on to her instead, bringing her into his chest and keeping her close where she belonged. This is my brother, Sai said to her. His name is Hades. He's the god of the underworld. Pleased to meet you. You can call me Desi. Vivi shrank away from Desi's outstretched hand, turning her face into Sai's chest. He's hot enough to cook my flesh. Desi half frowned and half grinned at the accusation, as though trying to ascertain if the remark was a compliment. He won't hurt you, said Sai. I told you, I'd never let anything hurt you. Vivi looked at him skeptically. Sai felt the urge to wipe the look from her brow. And then he realized that out of the flames, he'd been presented with another solution to her problem. In fact, said Sai, he can help us. Desi can travel by fire. There are fireplaces everywhere in the world. He can get us to Rome in no time. Vivi shook her head, and then she squirmed in his arms. Put me down. But darling, you can't stand on your own, Sai reasoned. Sai knew there were certain things you never said to a woman. When she asked if an outfit made her look fat, it was best to pretend you didn't hear her. Or even if a man meant it as a compliment, he should never, ever say she reminds him of his mother. Looking down at Vivi as she dangled in his arms, Sai knew he'd said the wrong thing just now. Chapter 6 Put me down, she insisted again. They were words Vivi never thought she'd say, and to a man, no less. She had to tell her fingers to unclench from the fabric of Sai's shirt, she had to reason with her thumping heart that he wouldn't send her flying across the room to land roughly on the hard floor. He'd said the factual truth of the matter. Vivi couldn't stand on her own two feet, but she could stand on her own. She had been all on her own since the moment she crash-landed into the River Usk, sent there by the one man that was supposed to give her unconditional love and support. And now... Suspended in the air in the arms of a man whose support she'd come to crave in a very short period of time, a man whose kisses she was starting to hunger for, Vivi had been let down. He had no right to say that to her. Did he not hear how those words sounded? 
did he not remember what she'd told him about her struggle to walk, to stand on her own two feet, and the important mission she had to take in order to keep that privilege? No, not likely. Because he'd strayed her off her path. He'd brought terrible monsters in her way. He'd made her swoon with his kisses. Her mind was muddled. She was defenseless. Now she just wanted her shoes and a cold body of water to sink into. But first, she had to get out of his grasp. With great reluctance, Sai did as he was told. He gently sat her in the chair. Vivi gripped the edges of the chair so that her hands wouldn't flail now that they were no longer tucked against Sai's body. My shoes, she demanded holding her head high, though the rest of her body felt like it barely tread the waters of a mighty current. Sai moved slowly in picking up her footwear. When he knelt to put them on her feet, she snatched them from him. Vivi, he sighed, please, let me help you. She couldn't look at him. She couldn't witness the pity she was certain was in his sea-filled gaze. With her shoes firmly in place, Grasping her heel and pinching her toes, Vivi stood. With cold feet, she took a step back from Sai. Vivi. No. She raised her hands to stop the warm stream of his words. How had she let this happen? How had he tricked her so? Here she was, up high above the water, somewhere in the clouds. A fire blazed bright. He was trying to eat her. That was the only conclusion. He'd had a sampling of her with that kiss. No, not a sampling. Her mouth had been the first course. He'd gotten her shoes off her and he'd been eyeing her toes. She'd been helpless in his embrace. He was toying with her, biding his time until he could take the first bite. I don't want this, she said. I don't want a prince or a ring or whatever you're trying to do to me. I don't need the fairy tale treatment. Fairy stories teach women to submit to princes, kings and wizards. I just want my shoes and you can't help me with that. You've done nothing but take me off my path. You took me away from the water. You brought me up to a high tower. You took my shoes. I'm sorry, he said. Trapping you is the last thing I would ever do. Vivi inhaled painfully, as though her lungs were filled with water long after she'd crested the surface. She hadn't expected his admission that he didn't want to keep her to hurt as much as it did. He was rejecting her on solid ground, but she felt like she was drowning. Then let me go, she said. Her voice was a whisper in a typhoon. Sai's jaw ticked. Vivi's pulse picked up. He wasn't sure if it was fear that he wouldn't let her go or fear that he would. In the end, his hand sank away from her and she felt like she was falling again. She hadn't realized that his grasp had been the only thing holding her up, but she refused to fall again. Sai stepped out of her path and she wobbled. His hand reached out but pulled back before touching her. She felt cold as she stepped away from him. She'd never felt the true sensation of cold having lived in a river her whole life. It made her skin crawl. She wrapped her arms around herself as she moved to the door, making sure to keep a wide berth from the fire demon. From the corner of her eye, she saw that Sai watched after her, but he made no move to follow. He no longer flashed his teeth at her. His lips were pursed and his skin looked a little green, as though he were sick to his stomach. He was likely realizing exactly how far he'd let things get with her, and now he was regretting it. Yes, that was it. That was the look on his face. Regret. Vivi turned away from him and out the door so that she didn't have to see that look any longer. What she couldn't understand was why walking... Chapter 7 Sai stared at the closed door. 
His limbs felt like they were being weighed down by a thousand metric tons of pressure. He heard his heart beating loudly in his ears, like the blades of a speedboat. The organ pushed at his chest, trying to propel him forward, but his feet were like anchors. He'd taken her shoes, and he very nearly hadn't given them back. He'd never been like this, crazed about someone, to the point where he wanted to bend them to his will. The pain Sai felt was deep. Vivi's rejection was crushing in on him. He'd watched as the Titanic sank in the Atlantic. He'd nearly forgotten the terrible sound of the boat ripping in two. It rang in his ears now as he felt his heart being rent apart. He could hardly breathe in the air of the room. It was cloyed at his throat now that it didn't carry her scent. The area was rapidly losing any sign of her. The accusation she'd made against him was also crushing. She thought he was using her. In a sense, he had been. He was using her to make him feel alive again. Sitting next to her, watching her eyes light up, watching the determination in her chin, they all made him feel alive. It had given him a new purpose. Sai wanted to show her more new things. He wanted to watch her marvel at new experiences. He wanted to watch her stand on her own. He wanted to taste her and feel her body pressed against his. She was right. She hadn't asked a single thing of him but directions. He'd pushed himself on her, forced his way into her life so that she'd forget the infernal shoes and stay with him for all time. He would give her his breath, his feet, his heart, if she would just walk back through that door. If she means that much to you, said Desi, then why are you still standing here with me? You heard her, said Sai. She rejected me. Desi shrugged. You reject humans all the time. I took away her autonomy. Literally, I took away her shoes. And I wasn't going to give them back at first. That is pretty low, said Desi, taking a woman's shoes from her. I think I may be in love, said Sai. Ugh, groaned Desi. He came to Sai and placed a heavy hand on his shoulder. I'm really sorry for you, brother. What do I do? Go after her. But you heard her, said Sai. Yeah, I also saw her. A little slip of a thing like that will not survive for long out in the mean streets of the world. Go after her, if nothing more than to protect her. Then, once you have a safe, you can lay on the north. Chapter 8 There was only land in sight. No water as far as Vivi could see. She watched people raise their hands and cars stopped, but she didn't dare go into any of their jaws, not without Sai next to her at the helm. But he wouldn't be next to her, not ever again. He'd let her go. He'd said trapping her was the last thing he wanted to do. Why did that hurt more than any other rejection? She was centuries old now. People came and went in her life all the time. Rarely did anyone seek her out. And if they did, it was only to use her for transport across a water ley line, just like one of those cars across the asphalt. Only a handful of people had ever touched her. No one had ever held her or called her beautiful or looked at her with hunger in their eyes that didn't involve chewing or blood spilling. The air was warm on the outside of Sai's home and outside of his embrace. Vivi shivered without his body heat next to her. Her shoes pinched her feet as she walked onward. She wasn't used to feeling the pain. She never walked this far before. She didn't dare complain. Walking was the dream of her life, and it had finally come true. But this long and lonely walk was starting to hurt. The air began to moisten as Vivi continued on. She perked up with the knowledge that, with moisture in the air, there must be a body of water nearby. 
She hurried towards it, eager for the first time since she'd started walking on her own to take her shoes off. But when she came to the waters, her smile melted as the foulest stench she'd ever inhaled hit her nose. Living in a body of water, Vivi was privy to rotting fish carcasses, even rotting human carcasses. Both of those smells together paled in comparison to what hit her nostrils from this water. But it was water, nonetheless, and all water, whether from the sky, from the city, or from a river, eventually led back to the seas and oceans. So this was her way out. There was a metallic linked fence that separated the waters from the street. Vivi looked first in one direction and then turned her head in the other direction of the street. She'd learned her lesson of crossing roads all too well earlier this evening. It took several minutes before she felt confident that no car would zoom down the street in either direction and crush her. With the first hurdle of crossing the asphalt accomplished, she looked at bridging the next. Vivi had never climbed a fence before. She gathered it was more easily done with bare feet or boots. She couldn't take her heels off because then all feeling in her legs would dissipate and she'd be left crumpled on the ground. Like she'd been back at Sai's place when the demon had stepped out of the fire. She hooked first her right foot in the nook of one link and then the left. Reaching up, she hefted her body higher. Luckily, she had a lot of upper body strength, having had to use her arms and torso to maneuver through the water for centuries. Climbing the fence wasn't as hard as she'd thought. She made it over to the other side and came to the water's edge. She spied more metal in the water, along with pipes and barrels and tanks. The water moved like sludge, and she saw why. It was filled with rotted food, feces, and chemicals. Vivi shook her head. Humans the world over were notorious for tossing all manner of refuse into the seas. She knew humans believed the waters would cleanse all of their sinful behaviors away. The sea did have its own form of cleansing itself, but not at the rate that humans filled it. Still, Vivi knew where this refuse was headed, and she prepared herself to follow its stream. She sat at the water's edge and slipped her shoes off. The relief from the pinching was only momentary. Once the magical shoes were off her feet, Vivi felt nothing. She wished the curse of her deformity had been placed on her heart instead of her legs and feet. She wished that the moment she'd left Sai's embrace that she no longer felt anything but she did. It was no matter. She couldn't process these brand new emotions right now. She had to get out of here first. She pulled up a protective bubble around herself and floated into the water. Turning, she reached for her shoes. But before she could get a hand on them, the current gave a mighty tug. There was more sludge in the liquid than actual water. Floating by her, Vivi saw all manner of paper and plastic. Solid oils and animal fats bumped into her bubble until it burst. She flailed, unable to gain any purchase or summon any magic that wasn't corrupted by the waste that pulled at her waist. She was being pulled away from her shoes, away from the ground. She tried to use her arms to push the thick fluid out of her way, but to no avail. It was as though moving through quicksand, only thicker. Vivi turned, searching for something to grab onto, something to stop or at least slow her momentum. And that's when she saw it. Up ahead were giant metal teeth. They opened and separated with a mighty creaking yawn. Then they clamped down hard, making a terrible clanking and ripping sound. The current pulled Vivi's body steadily towards the teeth. They opened wide, ready to swallow her whole and eat her. Chapter 9 Sai raced out of the doors the moment after the elevator hit the ground floor. He looked left and right, but Vivian was already long gone. 
She couldn't have gone too far on foot unless she'd gotten into a car. His gaze fell on the taxi stand. He was about to ask one of the valets if he'd put a pale woman with white hair wearing an orange dress and red shoes into a car. He knew no one could forget someone like his Vivi. But he also knew she wouldn't have climbed in a car. She would have gone for water. Horror weighed his brow at the realization. She would have gone for water. She might already be on a ley line. She might already be in Italy now. Rome itself didn't have any lines, but there were some nearer places that did. She could be anywhere. Sai raced over to the fountain across the street from the hotel. Those waters sprang from an underground well. Whatever waters Vivi's body was in, this current would find her. He closed his eyes and submerged his fingers into the water. Pushing aside all sea life, he searched for her. It took him only a moment before he found her. She wasn't in the ocean. She wasn't in the Mediterranean. No, he felt her presence nearby, near but faint. Like she was moving through sludge. He'd be the first to admit that many of the waters in and surrounding Greece were polluted, but none were as polluted as... Sai jerked his hand out of the clear fountain water. His fingers trembled as the night air sought to dry the droplets of his fingertips. He knew where she was. She was in the very worst place she could possibly be. Sai stood and surveilled his options. Driving was out of the question, not unless he could clear the roads of every single car on the congested streets of Athens. He could dive down into the well, but navigating the underground waterways was tricky, and he hadn't done it since they were installed. It would be too easy to lose his way. He looked up at the sky. He didn't have a choice. Anything else was too risky, and Vivi's life was nothing he'd ever gamble with. So in the blink of an eye, the clear evening clouded over and a deluge poured down onto the streets of Athens. With water raining down, Sai rose up on the droplets. The storm carried him across town as the waters flooded the streets. Athens hadn't seen a downpour like this since biblical times, when Sai had been an angry godling rebelling against his parents. He skated through the streets, ignoring the car accidents and drenched residents until he came upon the sewage system. He scaled the fence in a mighty leap. On the banks, he saw one of Vivi's shoes. It sat, solitary, while he caught sight of its pair sinking into the slop of the sewage. Sai crash-landed onto his knees. He was too late. He'd failed her. Nausea gripped his sore muscles. Pain struck a chord in his throat as he prepared to wail his anguish. Then he saw it. Movement in the sludge. Pale arms were headed straight for the teeth of the sewage machines. Sai didn't hesitate. He dove into the rank and rancid sewage, shoving aside refuse until he had her in hand. Her foot met his palm, and he tugged her to him. The current of the machines was powerful. It put up a fight for the prize that had slipped into this trap. But Sai was a god. With the might of his will, he separated the water from the refuse, sending all of the oils and chemicals and plastics and paper into the teeth of the mechanical device. The waste clogged the system and washed Sai and Vivi back to the banks of the drainage system. Sai held Vivi's limp body to him as the skies continued to empty. He allowed the rainwater to cleanse the grime from them as he rode a wave up beyond the sewers, above the congested traffic accidents, until they got to the beach where they'd met earlier tonight. The rain slowed as he set his precious cargo down at the water's edge. Sai removed the bedraggled garment from Vivi's body. No amount of dry cleaning, mechanical, or magical would save it. While her eyes remained closed, he laid healing hands on her body, finding and eradicating any and every ailment that had dared mar her perfection. Vivi's eyes fluttered open by the time he was done. 
His hands were resting on her ankle as he gazed up from her toes to find her face. He still had the urge to take her toes into his mouth. Dirty bastard that he was. But he didn't. It was not his right. To prove the point, she jerked her feet from him. I was nearly eaten alive, she said. Never would have happened, said Sai. I told you, I would never let anything harm you. She stared at him, disbelief in her wide, translucent eyes. You let me go. You said you wouldn't trap me. Not against your will. I want you to want me, for me. Her gaze was unblinking as she narrowed her eyes. You let me go because you wanted me to come to you of my own free will? Yes. Just like you flashed your teeth at me because you liked me. Sai nodded his head. Vivi shook hers. These emotions, they're all so confusing. Tell me what you want, Vivi. Ask anything of me, and it's yours. She searched his face for a moment. It took her a few tries before words came from her mouth. Sai was beside himself, holding his breath to make sure he didn't miss a consonant of her request. And finally, she spoke. I want for you to hold me and not let me go. He had to run the words through his head a couple of times before he trusted they weren't his heart's desire speaking over her. By the time he trusted her words were true, she was turning away from him, and he doubted himself once more. He needed to be sure, because once she got inside his embrace, he would never let her go. Come here. His voice was equal parts demand and plea. She turned back to him. Her eyes were downcast as though storm clouds hung in place of her eyebrows. Sai ached to reach out to her, to shine his inner light on those clouds he knew were his fault. But he had to be sure. And so he decided to meet her halfway. He held out his hand to her. Vivi stared at his open palm. Slowly, she placed one and then her other knee on the ground beneath her. She came to a kneeling position. Her hand reached out and was nearly in his grasp when she froze. She looked behind herself at her bare feet. Her bright eyes widened and possibly larger. She reached out and braced herself on the ground with both her hands. Carefully, gingerly, she rose from her knees and placed her feet under her and came to standing. I'm standing, she said. I'm standing on my own two feet. You're healed. He came to stand before her, still not touching her without her express permission. You? she asked. Did you do this? He nodded. Uncertainty flooded his chest. Had he overstepped his boundaries once again? How? she asked. I'm a god. A small laugh escaped her perfect lips. You healed me. She placed her hand in his. Sai couldn't help himself. His fingers curled around hers and he pulled her body into his chest. Do I have to worship you now? She asked. He grinned at that. It is I who worships you. She gasped, looking at him with the pall of disbelief in her clear eyes. Sai reached up and wiped the look away with the press of his lips to her forehead. I love you, he whispered into that space. That's what it means when a god offers his devotion. I think I understand it now. Vivi tilted her head up. The lines of disbelief evaporated and were replaced with droplets of water. Why people cry when they're happy. Like sea creatures and sailors alike, Sai knew that all waters ran into the sea. Yet the sea itself was never full. Sai's lips met Vivi's as they would do forever until the end of time. Though he kissed her now, he knew he would never have his fill of this water witch.
This has been Two If by C by Inez Johnson. Read for you by Wesley Paul. Welcome back. Hey, thanks so much, Inez Johnson, for being with us this week. Remember to go check out all her great stuff. She's got tons and tons of books for you to go read. And I've already downloaded the Dragon Shifter one, so I'm in on that. And um, don't forget that Alexa Riley's Teasing the Best Man is out for you guys. Oh, yeah. Download well, if you've been waiting okay. for that one that came. It's for after um, Sealed with a Kiss, if you're waiting for the friend's story. Absolutely. It's here. Go grab it. And up next week, we've got Shaw Hart with a brand new book called Saddled that I'm super excited to read. I can't wait. <laughs> so I guess that's it. All right. Tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read.